The title of our study is The Gospel and 1888. And I'm sure as soon as I mention that, all kinds of thoughts and ideas come to mind. I'm going to ask you in a minute what does come to mind. But before we do, I just want to express a little bit of an alarm, a little bit of a concern that I have. That I have. It's a bit of a burden as I encounter the amount of confusion that exists among us when it comes to the gospel. And the differing and sometimes contradictory and opposing ideas that are presented, each claiming to be the truth, it becomes very, very disturbing because especially when you have people who come and ask and, and they ask about this and they ask about that and there's all kinds of ideas and uh, it gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? And you go to one meeting and hear something, you go to another camp, you hear another thing and, and and why is this so? There is a lot of confusion. Hopefully today I want to try and alleviate some confusion and uh, in the process make things a little, a little clearer. So today I want to deal with a particular aspect uh, when it comes to some Seventh-day Adventist history. Now if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, don't you know, tune out. You're still going to receive some benefit. We're going to go to the Bible. But the reason why I want to examine some history is because many times the answer to the problems that uh, are happening among us finds its answer in history. And it's for this reason that there are many times all kinds of attempts at rewriting and redefining history. You find that not everybody is agreed on what the history actually is concerning something or another. As a matter of fact, some people actually make it a point to rewrite history in order to, have a to push a certain agenda. We're actually familiar with that in our own history. And so failure to correctly understand History and what happened in history guarantees current problems. There is a very important relationship there. Now, when it comes to our history, one particular outstanding event in our history is 1888, right? When I say 1888, what comes to your mind? Righteousness by faith, great. Anything else? Wagner and Jones, excellent. Anything else? Law and Galatians, all very good answers. It's, uh, it's one of those uh, numbers, dates, that carry a lot of significance. And sometimes the, the, the answer to the question is uh, many times charged, and uh, there is a certain amount of emotion when it comes to 1888. And of course, it all depends on how much you know as to what happened in 1888. We're going to review that very briefly. I'm not going to go into great detail, but we will touch on it. A little bit. And as you stated, of course, it's the year that the Lord sent this message through Jones and Wagner, which is summarized in righteousness by faith in Christ alone, or justification by faith. Ever since I heard about 1888, I had this, uh, this fascination. It was like this uh, mystery in history, right? And, and I went and, and, and found all the different books, and, and, and I would ask people about 1888, and I'd say, oh, you should read that book. I'd say, okay, well, I'll go get my hands on that book. And then someone else, oh, you should read that book. I'd go get my hands on that book. You should listen to that sermon, or get that series. And, and before long, I, I accumulated a, a good collection of books and material about 1888. And after a while, I got really overwhelmed and puzzled. Because it seemed to me like 1888, and understanding what the message was and what it was all about, it seemed to me like this big mammoth complex thing because I have to go through all these books and all these articles and all these items. You know what I'm talking about? Anyone else have that experience or am I on my own here? And after a while I started thinking, man, this thing is so technical and so complicated. And then he goes to ask someone else, he say, oh, did you read these sermons by this brother? No, you should read them. Okay, give, give me the sermon. And the list, and the more I looked at the amount of stuff I had, the more it grew. The more books I read, the more I discovered there were other books to read and other material to look at. And then I realized this thing is going to take me a long time to figure out. <laughs> and the, the, the fascination that we have with this particular event is portrayed in the amount of material and the volume of information and books that are constantly being put out about this important event. We know it's very important and so naturally we want to give it attention. And in giving it so much attention, I believe we have muddied the water. We have taken something that God designed to be simple and clear and we have complicated it to a matter 
that it's become a huge, huge debate. And we will see, as I said, uh, as we go along, what that is about. Of course, if you are not too familiar with that, in 1888, uh, Jones and Wagner brought a message focusing on righteousness by faith in Christ to the General Conference session uh, there in that year. And in the background, there was some theological discussion and debate over uh, some doctrines, <clears throat> particularly uh, the law in Galatians, as someone mentioned, and uh, uh, particularly over the question of the covenants. And in these doctrinal debates and these differences, they actually served to smother and cause to a great degree confusion and rejection over the message that was being brought at that conference. Now, Ellen White came out in support of the message of righteousness by faith, but when it came to the doctrinal aspects, she actually said there was error on both sides. And sadly, these doctrinal debates caused what we understand today to be that sad chapter in our history of rejecting that message and the associated blessings that were to come as a result of that. As I said today, there are many books that have been written about this subject over the years. And uh, after a while, to be honest with you, I, I decided to, to stop reading some of these books because I just was, I felt like I was getting nowhere. This was a while ago. And uh, I had read and accumulated some. I started with, I think the first one I read was 1888 Reexamined. Anyone read that one? Okay, that's a pretty high one. Oh, not too many. Okay, that's a good one you should read. That's what people will say. Anyway, <laughs> there's plenty out there. Uh, and, and I enjoyed it. And then, you know, I just, I just got this, this fascination. It seemed like this thing, and I'd never heard about it before. I'm like, why did anyone never tell me about this 1888 and what happened and so on? And read books by Wagner and books by Jones and sermons and all kinds of stuff. And I really enjoyed it. But along the way, I, I always felt that the, the the issue of 1888 was this elusive thing that I could just not define properly. But there were all these details and technicalities and historical aspects and explanations and verses and concepts. And I felt that I was drowning in detail. And that, brothers and sisters, to a large degree, I think, is not my experience alone. So I want to explore today a little bit uh, this general sense of haziness that exists. Now, it's one thing to know what the message was about when we ask a question and we give an answer, oh, it was about righteousness by faith. That does not necessarily mean that we understand what the message is. You realize that? Just because we can define the terms of what was taking place at the time does not necessarily mean we fully comprehend it. So today I want to explore this, this haziness that exists as to what really the message is. And when I say haziness, some people say, well, I'm not hazy. I know what it's all about. You might be hazy, but I'm not hazy. But if you ask enough people, you're going to get different emphasis and different answers and different explanations as to what 1888 really was all about. And so that's what I mean when I talk about haziness. So what is this message and what is not the message is what I want to answer in part what we're looking about, uh, at today. As Seventh-day Adventists, we find that... Uh, we have a very unique and distinct set of beliefs and doctrines. We regard ourselves, and many times, with a certain sense of pride as to the distinctive truths that we understand. You know what I'm talking about? We have very distinctive truths, the three angels' messages, the sanctuary truth, the Sabbath, present truth, uh, the high priesthood of Christ, all these unique in, in, in the Adventist emphasis of them, uh, truths make us get this idea about ourselves that we have this distinct position. We're just not like everyone else. We're different. We're unique. We're special. We have the present truth. We are the remnant people or the remnant church. You know what I'm talking about? And this sense of distinction that we feel about ourselves and in our doctrines I believe, to a large degree, this attitude, it gives us a certain attitude, which I don't think is very healthy, to be quite honest. But this attitude has somehow spilled over into our understanding of 1888 and what 1888 was all about. Let me explain just briefly what I mean. All too often, the 1888 message is seen as a set of biblical interpretations 
and theological understandings of certain verses. You know what I'm talking about? The message was, oh, they explained this verse this way, and that verse that way, and so on and so forth, so forth. And what we are doing is we are doctrinalizing. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm using it. <laughs> is we take a message and we doctrinalize it, we turn it into all that we break it down to all these technical parts, and we turn it into doctrines and in interpretations and scriptural expositions. You know what I'm talking about? It's just, it's just something that comes to us naturally because we like to define everything thus and so and so very accurately. Good motive, good intention, but in the process we muddy the waters. And so when we do that, I believe we turn a living message that had to do with a living person into a set of ideas and concepts and doctrines. And we go around telling people, this is what 1888 was all about. I've read books where the emphasis was, oh, they, uh, you know, Jones and Wagner explained and interpreted this verse this way and that verse that way, and all these different interpre interpretations, and that's what constituted the 1888 message, a big collection of technicalities. I have news for you, that is not the 1888 message. It is not at all. It definitely was in the background, but it's not the message. <clears throat> Many times also we find that in so doing, there is an underlying attempt to try and make the message of 1888 a very distinct and unique message that was never heard before in this world. Some people don't like the idea that 1888 was a re-emphasis of something. It has to be something new, something that maybe was never seen before Jones and Wagner spoke it, but that is not the case. Because after all, Jones and Wagner preached that message from where? The scriptures. Did Paul believe in that message? Yeah. That's who they were using to preach the message. Today many times I find that people who preach that message seem to think that doing so successfully means you have to quote generously from Jones and from Wagner. That that's the best way to preach that message. That's not entirely true. It's in the scriptures and the scripture is what it's all about. And so the doctrines are not, and the doctrinal debates are not what constitutes the message of 1888. The law in Galatians where Butler and Jones were discussing these things, that does not constitute the message of 1888. It was certainly there, but that wasn't the message. The covenants and the question of the covenants and which view was right and which emphasis was right, that was a doctrinal discussion. But that in itself, brothers and sisters, does not constitute the message of 1888. At the end of the day, the message was about a person, as we shall see. So, I want to uh, emphasize that by way of my lengthy introduction because, like I said, I have found that it's misunderstanding some of these things that's caused a whole heap of confusion to exist among us today. And the confusion, brothers and sisters, is not a simple one. Because today there are many self-appointed experts as to what constitutes 1888 who are very good at determining if you or me believe in 1888 judging by which scriptures we use and how, which interpreta interpretations we subscribe to, which position we are in. And herein is the danger because there is this pharisaic attitude that exists about the most wonderful message that has to do with a person. So what is the essence of this message? What, I, what am I trying to say? Here it is from someone who was actually there because a lot of these books that are written today are written by people who are not there. I think we all realize that, right? Here is someone who was actually there, who heard it in person. This is how the essence and core of that message is summarized to be. The Lord in His great mercy, we all know this, but I want to emphasize some aspects here. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious, precious message to His people through Elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. That's a person. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They had not lost sight of the law. They had not lost sight of a certain doctrine. They had not lost sight of interpretations. They had lost sight of a person. 
And so the message was to bring to the attention of everyone and bring them back to put their eyes on a person, Jesus. And he goes on to say, they needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. I think we all read that statement, right? That is the message, brothers and sisters. It is to look at Christ and to uplift Christ and to uplift His righteousness. It's about a divine person, not a particular theological position. I find this testimony, brothers and sisters, very, very, very revealing. The reason is this. This was someone who heard the message for themselves. And it's not the only time that we have that testimony. Here is another one. I've had the question asked, what do you think of this slide that these men are presenting? Why I've been presenting it to you for the last 45 years? The matchless charms of Christ. That's what these brethren were trying to present. This is what I've been trying to present before your minds. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I have heard, excepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented to me in vision that I see it so clearly and they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. It is a message to uplift the matchless charms of Christ. And it wasn't something new or unheard of before. It was bringing back to the attention of, of the people something that they had lost. And I says that's the same thing she's been trying to present for the last 45 years. Here's another one. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for men that which is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. This is what the message is about. When they begin to praise and exalt God all day long, and then by beholding they are becoming changed into the same image, what is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. That's what it was about. Interesting. Not once does she talk about any doctrines or particular interpretations. She doesn't say it when you understand the law in Galatians this way. She says there is a problem in us, and the problem has to do with which part of us? Our nature. He says when we understand truly what we are in our nature, that we are totally worthless, then we are ready to appreciate what Christ has to offer. The problem was, brothers and sisters, that many of these brethren were not willing to look at where the real problem was, and they got caught up in fighting over doctrine and interpretation. And the same thing exists today. And this is why we want to look at that a little closer. So when we understand that we have a problem in our nature, then we are able to appreciate that the righteousness of Christ is ours. And it's, of course, ours by faith, as we shall, as we shall see. Here's another statement. Beautiful, short and beautiful. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up all others. Christ, our righteousness. This is life eternal. Can you fill in that dot, dot, dot? That they might... Know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, and thou hast sent. That's the verse that's quoted there. One subject will swallow up every other. Brothers and sisters, the living message of the gospel is not a doctrinal exposition of Bible passages. It is a person, a living person. You cannot appreciate that until you realize the root of the problem in our nature. It is much easier to ignore the problem and focus on ideas and concepts and palm them off as the message. And so, that is why I'm emphasizing this particular aspect that it is not a doctrine. Many times I've had discussions with people, and I, I, I have this uh, uh, thing, you know, where people say, oh, well, if, if you understand the Bible this way, you're not preaching 1888. Or if you explain it that way, you, you've rejected the 1888 message. And what the criteria for judging is, is a set of 
interpretations and doctrines. What have we done? Has it come to this? Is God waiting for his people to come to just the right understanding in these doctrines? Not at all. God is waiting for his people to have Christ. Many times the emphasis when it comes to 1888 is the law. And this is what, was, what the problem was. The brethren at the time felt that Jones and Wagner were doing away with the law. This was actually an accusation that was made against them. He said, you know, you're talking about righteousness by faith so much. You know, what about the law? You're leaving out the law. And in uh, speaking about the law, they were referring particularly to our beloved fourth commandment about the Sabbath, correct? The Ten Commandments, but especially the Sabbath. That's, that's many times the one we like to focus on because that's the one that's being downtrodden and ignored by most Christians. Here's another interesting statement. In that light, it is true, men will say, you are too excited, you're making too much of this matter, and you do not think enough of the law. Now you must think more of the law. Don't be all the time reaching for this righteousness of Christ, but build up the law. And here's the answer. Ms. White says, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Without dew or rain, let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. May God help us that our eyes may be anointed with eyes of that we may see. Amen. Brothers and sisters, today we have a very similar situation that exists. It is looking to the law and seeking from the law that which the law can never, ever give us. That's why God sent that message. And uh, looking at the gospel, I just want to go over some verses here. I'm familiar with that. I just want to summarize some points. In Jeremiah 23, verse 5 to 7, the following is recorded for us. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Why is he mentioning the exodus and God pulling his people out of Egypt. Because up to that time, this was the greatest event. Remember in the introduction of the Ten Commandments, God says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. God is saying here through Jeremiah, I'm going to do something. You're going to forget about this event of Egypt in light of what I'm doing. It will fade. You're no longer going to say the Lord that brought us out of Egypt, the Lord that brought us to Sinai and gave us the law, because this is what the people were glorying in. You'll have something else to boast about. What is it? This branch, who is called what? The Lord, our righteousness. So the commandments is what's being referred to here. The law that was given at Sinai when God brought his people out of Egypt. God's saying, I'm bringing something that's going to supersede and far outweigh that event in the Lord, our righteousness. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. We need that message today as much as was needed back then. We desperately need that message today. And this is why in Galatians chapter th uh, 2, verse 16, this is what Paul says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We all know that. We all say we believe that, but the question is, do we really believe that? I want to put it to you, brothers and sisters, today, among us, we have the most outrageous legalism masquerading as the 1888 message. You realize that? Because many people think that the 1888 message is all about saying the right terms, <coughs> believing the right doctrines, and interpreting things just the right way. If you use certain buzzwords, you believe the 1888 message. If you say agape a lot, you believe 1888. If you say corporate repentance, then, then you have a concept of what 1880 is about. If you talk about the in Christ motif, then, then you have some understanding of what it is. Do you know what I'm talking about? There are these buzzwords that, that surround this message that if, if you're in with the, with the understanding and you use them a lot, you can pass off as believing and understanding the 1888 message. It does not matter which words or ideas or concepts you say or use, brothers and sisters. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
It's a very, very serious situation. It pays lip service to righteousness by faith. While quoting generously from Jones and Wagner and presenting a message that actually hides the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It drowns him in interpretation. It sits in judgment on anyone who disagrees on interpretation and becomes a debate over this verse and that verse. That's exactly what happened back then. And in the process, we lose sight of Christ, brothers and sisters, the Lord, our righteousness. Today, I find that people are preaching the law and presenting that as the message of 1888. Do you realize that? What did we just read from someone who was there? Let the law take care of itself. What did Paul just say in Galatians? No flesh shall be justified by that law. None at all. As a matter of fact, wonder of wonders. I have even heard it said and read that the message of 1888 was actually about keeping the feast days. Now, I'm not necessarily picking on feast days, but what are, what are feast days? They are also part of the law. The law. Not, not even the Ten Commandments law. Now you're in the ceremonial law. Now, ceremonialism, people say, you know what, brother, this was the secret issue in 1888. You don't, you don't realize that? Now, if you've heard that, uh, I don't know if you have or not, but when I first heard that, I was in shock. Brothers and sisters, let me, let me give you a divine recommendation. Let the law take care of itself. And I know someone's going to hear that and say, this brother is doing away with the law. That's what they were saying back then. That's why Paul asked the Galatians, you know, did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of the law, or by, by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Romans chapter 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here is this new source that is outside the law that gives you what? Righteousness. It says the righteousness of God is without the law being manifested. You know what without the law means? Outside of the law. You don't get it from the law. You get it from a person, a living person. The name of the person is Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. That's what the message is all about, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we say, well, that's, everybody believes that. You know, let, let's, let's emphasize something that, that we can disagree on. It is the emphasis on the law that steals away from the author of the law. I don't think I need to tell you that the author of the law is superior to the law, is greater than the law. And yet so many times we emphasize the law instead of the author of the law, or different aspects of the law instead of the law. We read earlier that the root of the problem is we need to understand what we are in our nature. And when, talks, when we talk about what we are in our nature, we're talking about a problem that comes to us by inheritance. I want to briefly also look at this verse. This is one of the most controversial verses, I reckon, in the Bible, because there's so much that has been written on it in opposing ways. Romans 5.19, For by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made Righteous. This one verse, there's many others, but this one verse very eloquently summarizes our problem and the solution to our problem. Very clearly and very distinctly. It says, by one man's disobedience, who's that? Adam. Many were made sinners. How many? Well, someone say, well, it doesn't say all, brother. It says many. You know, we need to go by every word that's written. As many as are born of that one man. You see, the point Paul is making here is not, uh, he's trying to emphasize that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. One affected more than one. That's his point. Many. As many as are related to that one, they are affected by his disobedience. And as a result of that disobedience, they are made what? Sinners. This is a big can of worms, I know. <laughs> But I just wanted to, uh, to think about what the verse says. 
Whose disobedience made the many sinners? Adam. Was it their disobedience? No. no, it is the one man's disobedience. Some people have a very serious problem with that. And it's our relationship, brothers and sisters, by birth, by our first birth, to the first Adam, that's what makes us partake of that problem. It was Adam's disobedience that made the many sinners, as many as are born of him. Someone say, well, that's, that's not good news. Well, that's not the end of the verse, praise the Lord, right? There's the rest of the verse there. It says, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's the second Adam, that's Christ. And then it says here, many, how many? As many as are born of him. And therefore, what makes them righteous? Their obedience? No. no, it says his obedience. That's why he is called the Lord, our righteousness. That's why the law has nothing to do with this verse right here. As far as making anyone righteous. It is the obedience of the one. And then I, I find it very interesting. Paul is very careful in his terminology. He says, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Right? That's what tense? Future tense. When will they be made righteous? When they are born again, because there is one birth from the first Adam that precedes the birth from the second Adam. And so, brothers and sisters, this is our inheritance. There is no reason to be alarmed, upset, or distressed about that because we have a solution to that problem. Let me read a couple of statements. As a result of Adam's disobedience, every human being is a transgressor of the law sold under sin. I don't hear this statement quoted very often in this context. Every human being, as a result of whose disobedience? Adam. Adam's. Every human being is what? Not will be, right? Not when one day he chooses to sin, then he becomes a sinner. No, it says every human being is a transgressor of the law. That's the definition of sin, sin right? First John 3, 4. But Adam failed to bear the test, and because he revolted against God's law, all his descendants have been sinners. Sinners. You ever heard that statement before? They're the statements nobody likes to quote very much because it sounds really bad for us, you know? But brothers and sisters, praise God, because on the same principle of that inheritance we receive from the first Adam, that's the consistent way that God applies the inheritance that we receive from the second Adam. Because the issue has to do with our nature. Here's one more. Adam sinned and his posterity became sinners. You realize that? We do not sin because we just choose to do it and that's what turns us into sinners. We sin because we have been made sinners by the choice of the first Adam. The tree comes before the fruit. Sinners produce sin. It's not the other way around as far as the human race is concerned. Because this inverse is also true, brothers and sisters. Now, the reason I'm going into detail here, because this was a core part of the message in 1888 to appreciate the righteousness of Christ. We were told we first have to understand the true problem in our nature. You know, the problem you have in your nature and my nature does not come or did not come to us because one day we chose to do something wrong. We were born with a problem and the name of the problem is sin. Now, however you want to call that, however you want to define that, this is what the scripture presents. You know, am I... <laughs> And I'll come to that in a minute. Our nature is not neutral. Some people say, oh, it's a sinful nature. Uh, you can't say born sinners. You have to say sinful nature. Wh whatever you call it, we have a problem, and the name of the problem is sin. And the solution to the problem does not lie in the law. It lies in a person. Amen. This is the, the core concept on which the gospel is built. If we fail to understand that, we cannot appreciate what Christ has accomplished for us. I want to put some other statements here. The reason being... It is so vital because if you fail to understand the, the bad news, you cannot appreciate the good news. These are self-explanatory. I hardly have to say anything. Human nature is depraved and is justly condemned by a holy God. What is condemned? Is it say the choices and actions we take? It goes to the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? Nature. Human nature. Selfishness is the essence of depravity. Selfishness is the great law of our degenerate nature. Selfishness occupies that place in the soul where Christ should sit enthroned. Well, what, what, how, how does that happen? Where do we get all this selfishness from? Selfishness is inwrought in our very being. It has come to us as an inheritance. 
So I don't yeah. need to ask for a show of hands. That's our inheritance, brothers and sisters. That is what makes our nature depraved and messed up. We did not become selfish because we chose. My little uh, cute girl, baby, she's pre-programmed to be naughty. <laughs> you realize that? Yeah. She's pre-programmed with selfishness. Because we are her parents, me and her mother, my wife. We, we wish that's not the case, but that is the case. And denying it is not going to help, you know, she's all nice and cute and all that. Oh, don't say that. that that's, we're kidding ourselves, brothers and sisters. There is a problem. And praise God that there is a solution to the problem. The solution is not a, a restricted to a particular age group, okay? The solution is for all humanity, not just one particular age group. Okay, let's keep going. All sin is selfishness. And the inheritance of children is that of? Of sin. I don't think there is any other way or any other conclusion that you can come to from reading this summary other than what the scripture has already said, that by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And that is why the law cannot repair our nature. The only way we can repair nature is to produce or to give it another source of life that is not corrupted with this selfishness or with this sin. Galatians 3.20 uh, 21, sorry, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. You see what is it that we needed here? According to this verse, it says we needed life. Because the life that we received from Adam has been corrupted at its source. It has been infected with sin and selfishness. And that comes to us as an inheritance. And there is no law that even the God of heaven can give that can solve this problem and give you life. And this is why God gave us a person, He gave us His only Son, to become the new source of life, to give us a life that is not infected and corrupted with sin and selfishness. We receive this life through the beautiful process that is called the new birth. That is what Christ is all about. We receive His life. That's what Jones and Wagner were trying to present to the brethren. And the brethren were like, hold on, hold on, hold on. What about this verse? What about this interpretation? What about this passage? The same is today. That's why it's called righteousness by faith. And that's why it's called the Lord our righteousness. And that's why scripture also says elsewhere that the law is not of faith. We looked at sin briefly. We looked at our inheritance. I want to ask you a question. What is righteousness? You, you can answer, don't worry. Okay, right doing, right doing. Any other answers from the back? Being right with God, okay. The most common answer we have, right, righteousness is right doing. Very true, but incomplete. In Christ, yes, okay. That, that's absence of sin. Absence of sin, okay, very good. Very good answers. Let's look at the verse. In 1 John 2, 29. It says, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And this is many times where we say, look, it's you're doing righteousness. Righteousness is right doing. But brothers and sisters, I put it to you, it is impossible for you to produce right doing before you are born of him. That's what comes first, right? So righteousness cannot be right doing first and foremost. It has to be right being. And then when you are made right, when you are born of Him, then you can follow and produce righteous acts or right doing. You with me? The tree is before the fruit. The fruit does not produce the tree. The tree produces the fruit. You see, just as the fact that we are sinners, that's why we, we commit sins. In like manner, we must first be made righteous in order to do righteousness. Our problem is our definition, our understanding of righteousness as right doing forces us to go to the law and try and do right because that is what righteousness is by our definition and in the process we pay lip service to Christ and we miss that it is first vital for us to be born and made righteous let me read a couple of statements to that effect as well righteousness means being good and doing good in that order brothers and sisters in that order you must be good before you can do good. 
You must be good before you can do good. You know why? Because first you were made bad and that's why you do bad. That's the two Adams. That's the conflict of sin and righteousness. It's something that has happened to us. That's the inheritance we receive when we are born again. And that's why the Bible tells us that God put every single blessing that there ever is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Does that blessing include righteousness? Yes, it's in a person, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, I say, yeah, we all know that. Do we really all know that? You see, excuse me. It is so subtle. The enemy works so subtly through the ideas and things that we are taught. When we think that, you know, the message was all about all these different aspects and, and righteousness, the law is righteousness. If we do the law, that's righteousness is right doing and so on and so forth. And we get confused and along the way, we take our eyes off Christ. That's what had happened back then. That is what is our greatest danger today. And that's why I want to emphasize that it is Christ our righteousness. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ's death was vital and necessary to bring us righteousness. Not the righteousness that comes from the law, but the righteousness that is without the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What was necessary was the death of Christ. The Bible says He has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I have heard, sadly, a number of times, not sure if you've heard this as well, a statement that goes like this. The cross brought nothing new to humanity because God had provided it all there from the beginning. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that or not. I'm, going to ask, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I have. And when I heard that, I was very alarmed because, brothers and sisters, this is a sad blindness and denial of the power of the cross. That verse tells us it was necessary for Christ to die in order to give us righteousness. If there was any other means, if there was anything else that God could provide without the death of Christ, then God would have done it. And if we do not recognize that fact, then the Bible says Christ has died in vain. vain. I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about that. Has the cross brought something new to humanity or not? I know this is a, maybe a theologically loaded question. Depending on what verses you might understand in all kinds of other areas. But I want you to think about that. You realize that the cross of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ, that is by far the greatest act in the entire history of the universe from eternity past to eternity of the future that has ever happened or that will ever happen. Nothing has ever been as great as that and nothing in the future will ever match it. You realize that? When the Son of God, the divine Son of God, took on humanity and died on the cross and was raised as the second Adam. So important is this event that the God of heaven is going to shift his throne and come and live here on the very spot where that greatest act was enacted. And if that greatest act failed to give to us something new, then what in the world would exceed that? Absolutely nothing. I want to look at what Christ actually did bring. See, the cross of Christ stands at the center of time. The history of mankind is, is, is marked before and after the cross. The history of salvation is marked before and after the cross. The history of the gospel is marked by the cross of Christ. It is the death of Christ that made all the difference because it was at the cross of Christ that finally Satan was defeated completely Amen. and the serpent's head was crushed. Up until that time, for 4,000 long years of earth's history, Satan was not defeated. It was only at the cross that something happened that had never been seen before as a result of which the floodgates of heaven were opened. This is how the Bible talks about it. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Interesting verse. Paul here refers to something called the dispensation of the fullness of times. Interesting. 
Because when we look at the cross, we doubtless come to the point of dispensations. When we talk about dispensations, some people start getting a little bit nervous. They say, oh, this brother's preaching dispensations. Paul talks about here this dispensation of the fullness of, the, of times. What does that mean? What's he talking about? A dispensation is an administration. He says, in this dispensation of the fullness of time, God has accomplished something. He's going to gather all things in Christ, in heaven and in earth. He's gathering everything to one center. In the center is Christ, and he refers to this happening in the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's when Christ came, brothers and sisters. He's referring to the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the marker of this dispensation where God has gathered everything in Christ. For 4,000 years, this was promised to humanity. Christ came and accomplished that when the Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. In uh, Hebrews 9, it refers to it as the time of reformation. In the beginning of the book of Hebrews, it says, in these last days. That's the dispensation of the fullness of time. That's the dispensation that began with the cross of Christ. When sin was finally defeated. Sin and Satan was finally defeated and condemned in the flesh. You realize that had never happened before. And when that happened, that's what Jeremiah said, you know, one day I'm going to bring the Lord our righteousness. Then you're not going to say anymore, the Lord God which brought us up out of Egypt. Because you're going to have an event that far exceeds and supersedes that. That event is the cross of Christ. And it stands as the marker between the dispensation before and after. Peter talks about Christ who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times. You know there are different times? We're living in the last one. And that last one, you know when it began? From the cross. I'm going by the, you know, someone say, oh, he's talking about 1798 or 1844. I'm talking about the verses in the scripture. The last days, brothers and sisters, began, according to the scriptures, from the cross of Christ. You know why? That's when the great controversy was won. Not finished, won. The controversy was won on the cross. Satan was defeated. And from that point, we're living in the last days. That's why the book of Hebrews opens with that. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in what? These last days spoken unto us in his Son. He's still speaking. He spoke when Christ came as a man and he's still speaking because Christ has not left us and sent us someone else. Christ is still dwelling in our hearts as we understand to be his spirit. And so when we look at the dispensations, I want to look at that a little bit because there is this idea that exists that to believe in different dispensations or time periods before and after the cross and that there are differences in them is actually the opposite of the gospel. Some people actually think that that is not what constitutes the truth. We saw it in the scriptures and we're going to see a little bit in the spirit prophecy. But before we do, I want to share a little bit of an experience. Recently, I, I read another book. This, is, this was a big book. This is about a 500 page book. And we're almost there. So if you just hold on a minute, we're, we're almost going to be there. We're almost finished. A 500 page book dealing with 1888 <laughs> and, and the, the history of what, what happened and so on and so forth. I, I kind of uh, hadn't read something on that for a while. And, and I was really amazed because, as interesting as it was, there was this recurring point that the author was making, and that is to believe in consecutive dispensations is to reject the 1888 message. Time and again, that kept coming out through the book. To believe in consecutive dispensations is to reject the 1888 message. Because Wagner said, you know, that there is the everlasting covenant, and it goes into all the theology and the doctrines and so on and so forth. And I was really troubled when I read that. Because I know the Bible teaches that. We just saw it in the scriptures. And so what would lead people to come to that? Make judgments on the message based on doctrine. And it's just a confirmation to me that we somehow have missed something about the message. Like, for, in order for you to accept Christ and His righteousness, you have to subscribe to a certain set of doctrines defined by the self-appointed experts today of 1888, who were never there, who never heard Jones, or Wagner, or never even a lot were alive at the time. That's why I read to you a first-hand account 
of uh, the servant of the Lord there. She was, of course, there. Now, there, was a, there is a, a wrong teaching about the dispensations and covenants. That's what we're dealing with when we talk about dispensations. It deals with the covenants as well. There is a wrong teaching and there is a right teaching. There is no question about that. But just because you have the right teaching does not mean you have righteousness by faith. Did you know that? Just because you believe the law in Galatians to be all oh, moral, not ceremonial, or, or both, and does not mean you have righteousness by faith. We have, brothers and sisters, we have doctrinalized righteousness by faith. We have turned it into a set of doctrines and ideas and beliefs and <coughs> concepts and words. And if we say it all right and we interpret it all right, then that's what we think righteousness by faith is. And then we sit in judgment over those who disagree and we say, you know what? They don't know righteousness by faith. They don't have it. They've rejected the message. That's a problem that exists among us, amongst us today. Realize that? And in so doing, we lose sight of Christ. So I want to look at dispensations. Is it true that if you believe in dispensations that are consecutive, you do not believe in 1888? I'll ask you a question. I think you all know the answer. Do you think Ellen White accepted the 1888 message? Yeah. And everyone said? Yeah. Of course, yes. She was one of its biggest supporters. And for more, we read it. It says the Lord in his... Uh, mercy. mercy, thank you, sent a, a divinely appointed message through Jones and Wagner. Let's read what she has to say about that. Just a brief uh, couple of statements. This Sabbath commandment is the great truth which unites the two dispensations, the Mosaic and the Christian, and the light upon the sanctuary shows their relation to each other. How many dispensations? Mercy. Two. Do they coexist at the same time? One is called the Mosaic, one is called the Christian. What is the marking point between them? It's Christ. It spells it out. This is our pages 220. The prophet John the Baptist was the connecting link between the two dispensations. Does that mean they're consecutive? Does that mean that the two dispensations are consecutive? They follow each other? Yes, of course. You better believe it. John was the forerunner of Christ. And in his life and in the life of Christ that's the transition point when you move from one to the other under his here it is spelled out again under the New Testament dispensation he that's John the beloved was honored as the prophet Daniel was honored under the Old Testament dispensation we refer to that also as the old and new covenant another word for testament is covenant so make no mistake about it so here is someone who accepted 1888 message promoted it and taught it and defended it and this is how she understood the covenants why because the cross of Christ brothers and sisters is the great center no, no wonder Paul says God forbid that I should glory save in the what in the cross you understand now why you know in the uh, some statements say in, in the kingdom in heaven when we get to heaven it says the cross will be what the science and song of the redeemed Do you remember reading quotes like that why is that if it brought nothing to, new to humanity? Why is that if God had provided everything already from the beginning? Because in the cross we have Christ and in Him came every blessing, every single blessing that God had promised to humanity. It was accomplished and given when Christ came as a man and when He rose as a man. Here is another one. The Christ typified in the former dispensation is the Christ revealed in the gospel dispensation. Former and present dispensations. If we put it in a diagram, this is what it would look like. Before the cross, we have the Mosaic dispensation or the Old Testament dispensation or the former dispensation, also known as the Old Covenant. After the cross, we have the Christian dispensation or the Gospel dispensation, which is what the New Testament is all about. What made the difference is Christ. And in the backdrop, in the background, we have this everlasting covenant, where before the cross it was promised. That's why God gave that Old Covenant. And after the cross, it was fulfilled. And so one, one, one gospel, two consecutive dispensations. That's the gospel of the second Adam, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this new element, brothers and sisters, is none other, as we said, none other than the divine human life of the Son of God and the Son of Man. That's what the resurrection brought. You don't get that from the law. You don't get that from interpretation of Scripture. You get that from a person. You don't get that by learning concepts and ideas and hoping to educate yourself into the truth. You get that by a divine spiritual miracle called the new birth. And the new birth actually means that you receive something that you did not have in you before. 
a real thing. Just because it's spiritual and invisible to us doesn't mean it's unreal. Doesn't mean it's just a concept. It's just as real as the physical world that we see with our eyes. Just as real as our flesh and bones. Just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it's not real. And so this is how the life of Christ, brothers and sisters, becomes ours. That's what happens when we are born again. When that life becomes ours, a transformation takes place and immediately you are made righteous. And only then can you do righteousness. That's why it's called righteousness by faith. There is no amount of doctrine that's going to give you that, I promise you. Only Jesus can do that. And so I want to close with that thought. It's a beautiful thought. It summarizes well what I want to say. And I pray it will be an encouragement to you as it has been an encouragement to me. And this is what it says. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. Do you understand why? This living message about a person has been technicalized and doctrinalized and dissected and broken down into all these different ideas that has caused this haze of confusion. It has caused this debate. It has caused this strife. It has caused people to sit in judgment of other people. It's all the effort of the enemy to hide Jesus. Because you know what this statement is saying? It says, brothers and sisters, if you and I really get it, if we really get it, the power of Satan will be broken. And what is it that we need to get? That this precious righteousness of Christ comes to us as a free gift. Not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, but because God loved us so much that He's willing to give us this gift. He says, if we really get that, Satan's power will be broken. Boy, you know, I sat and meditated on that for a while. I thought, wow, boy, if we really got it, that, that's it. This is great news. Amen. Do you? Know the Lord our righteousness. Do I know the Lord our righteousness? Is the power of Satan broken or are we too busy giving fuel to the arguments and debates that Satan has generated to hide from us this beautiful truth? I really, really pray that you will take this thought to heart, take it to, in your mind as you're sitting on your, lying on your bed, the head on your pillow tonight, and just think about it. Meditate on it. Uh, meditate on it in the biblical way, okay? In the, in the right way, that is thinking on the truth, not in the other ways Brother Vengrate was sharing with us a little bit. When we truly understand, and if you don't understand it, look, it's a simple prayer, right? Ask and it shall be given. Lord, help me understand it. Help me appreciate what this truth is all about, that the righteousness of Christ is mine freely, not because of anything I've done, not because of how many Sabbaths I've kept, not because of how many Bible studies I've done, not because of anything that we have done or deserve. It is ours freely in Christ. And so it's my challenge, and this is my appeal, and this is my closing thought. The message of righteousness by faith is not about the law. It's about a person. It's about the Lord, our righteousness. Do you know Him? That's the question that matters. Not do you know all the details of the message. Do you know the person? Let's kneel as we close in prayer.